Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and in this video, we are taking a look at the iFi Neo Stream streamer DAC. It's got preamp functionality, basically a doer of many things audio, but its primary purpose is as a streamer, as the name Neo Stream strongly suggests. This is a 1300 US dollar and 1300 euro product. Okay, if you are over on the other side of the Atlantic uh, from me. So same number and just different currency unit there. And uh, iFi sent this to me, oh goodness, it's been a while ago. Near, it was early in the year 2023, I believe, when this arrived. And so it has been in my system for well over three months now. And so I have used it quite extensively and I'm sure that you have heard me uh, uh, mention its usage in many of my videos as of late as a piece of source gear. So it's really time to, uh, to review this and all that. Anyway, iFi sent this to me. They have asked nothing in return other than a fair and honest evaluation, and they have made no attempt to influence my opinion on this piece one way or the other. So let's do shameless self-promotion and then we'll come back on the other side of that and we will talk about the iFi Neo Stream. Hey, thanks for watching this video. Please remember to hit that like button and if you haven't, please subscribe. Also, I have a Patreon set up so that you can help support me on a monthly basis and I've set up a PayPal donation so that you can help me out in that way too if a monthly dis a subscription does not make sense for you. Links for all of that, including the benefits in the description below. Please check those out. All right, on with the show. Okay, get yourself comfortable because this thing is feature packed and so this review is going to take a while uh, because there is just a lot of ground to cover here. I'm going to drop the main points of this here in a moment. I'm also going to do my best to timestamp this video quite thoroughly. So uh, expand the description down below and you can find the timestamps of the parts that you are interested in and jump right there. All right. So my takeaways here, my, my main points on this unit, which I'll go ahead and state up front, and again, see timestamps for each of these points in the description below, is that this is a well-built, feature-packed unit that is pretty easy to set up and use, although it does have a couple of usage quirks, which I will unpack later in the video, all right? Sonically, from its digital outputs, it can sound pretty darn good um, and a little bit better than its sibling model, the, the Zen Stream and all of that. So pretty good audio performance from the digital out. The analog out using the built-in DAC is less impressive to my ear. So we'll unpack that um, as we get into the review here as well. Um, and then even with all of those features and the build quality and then the sound performance and all of that, uh, $1,300 for this, I'm having trouble convincing myself that it's worth quite that much, but it's not far off of that. So I think it might be slightly overpriced as a whole unit, but not egregiously so. All right, but it's still a product that I enjoyed using and it really helped me learn some cool things about source gear and all of that. And as a reviewing tool, all of those features and the outputs and all of that that we're gonna talk about here, I mean, it's really invaluable as a reviewing tool, I think. So I hope that uh, iFi lets me hang on to it for a while longer to one, see if they fix a couple of the usability quirks that I'm going to mention soon, but then also it's just a, a good, a valuable tool as a reviewer and has been a big help to me here um, in these months that I have used it. So we're going to unpack all of this in the review. So let's start with the build quality and those features and all of that that I just mentioned. All right, so... What we see here is it's got the iFi Neo series aesthetic to it, okay? Silver case with this kind of like groove thing going around here around the volume knob. We have on the front a display screen which can help with menu navigation and also displays track info and album art 
um, when you are streaming music through it. But otherwise, the front panel, we have this uh, knob right here, which can adjust the output level. Okay, if you're gonna use this as a preamp, it helps navigate the menu if you're gonna use the front panel menu here and all of that. Then we just have two buttons here. One is power, one is like a menu navigation and display select button. Okay, and then of course, the obligatory high-res audio sticker because of course. All right, round back. We get a bunch of interesting stuff here. Um, just a lot going on. So here is the antenna for Wi-Fi connection. We have three flavors of SPDIF digital audio output. We have RCA coaxial, we have Toslink optical, and we have AES EBU balanced uh, XLR connection basically for SPDIF there. All right, then we have, um, still let's stick with digital audio outputs for a moment. We have an I squared S digital audio output, and then we have a USB digital audio output that has iFi's active noise cancellation built into it. The other USB port that you see here is for connecting to an external hard drive with, with music files on it if you want that. So external hard drive, uh, flash drive kind of memory, that sort of thing. All right, we have two stereo analog outputs for the built-in DAC. We have the unbalanced RCA pair, and then we have a 4.4 millimeter Pentacon balanced output, which is getting to be fairly standard fare for iFi now. Um, in these smaller footprint designs, they like to put those 4.4 millimeter balanced outputs on there. All right, over here, We've got three options for networking connections for hardwire connection here. We have standard RJ45 for uh, ethernet cable. We've got an M12 connector here, which I'm honestly not sure what that really is, okay, but it's here. And then a cool thing is they have an optical ethernet connection here, um, which may sound a little bit gimmicky, but I actually found that to be quite a nice feature to have. So we'll unpack that a little bit more here in a moment. Then we just have a system upgrade USB-C port and then the power input, which is a nine volt, three amp to 15 volt, two amp um, power input there. And let me show you real quick. The included stock power supply is iFi's iPower X. Okay, which as far as including a stock power supply goes, this is one of the better um, power supply options out there, I think. Um, yes, it does have the transformer box here, like right by the wall outlet, which can take up uh, space on a power strip, but it's not like all that thick this way. So it actually it doesn't eat up a ton of space or as much space as some other wall warts do. Okay, that's the included power supply there. All right, um, iFi also ships it with this little stand here. So you can choose to orient this thing horizontally on your desk or on your shelf, okay? Um, like this, like a standard audio product, or you can sit it inside this metal stand here and hold it up vertically. The display screen on the front here will rotate much like a smartphone screen does as you rotate and change its orientation based on how you set this up. I used this stand and kept it in a vertical orientation in my system pretty much the entire time that I used it just because it fit into my system better that way. Okay, but it's a, it's a nice option to have that, I think, um, for a lot of setups. Okay. Let's talk about that um, optical ethernet here really quick. So what is that? So really all that is, is it's just an ethernet connection converted to a, an optical digital signal, kind of like what Toslink digital optical cables do for SPDIF digital audio connections. It's a similar idea, it just does that kind of thing for ethernet. Why might you want to do that as well? It gives you basically almost perfect galvanic isolation. So if you are not hardwired in with a, you know, uh, an electron transmission based, you know, copper cable kind of ethernet cord, 
then you uh, don't get the noise that sometimes get trans sometimes can get transmitted through that kind of connection. So converting that electron-based signal to a photon or light-based signal really helps clean up some of the noise. So iFi okay, uh, includes this thing that they have called the OptiBox. Okay, the name is written right there on the back. And really all this does is it takes the Ethernet cable, you know, a standard like wire, you know, copper wire kind of electron carrying conductor Ethernet cable, convert it from that into an optical output. And then there is a USB-C port right here so that you can uh, plug just like a standard USB-C, USB cable into there. And then on the other end, put like basically just like a cell phone charging wall wart kind of thing to power this up, okay, because it's a five volt half amp input, okay, to power this. But anyway, it will convert the ethernet to a digital audio or an optical output. And then iFi also includes this optical ethernet cable. So one end of this plugs into this output of the OptiBox, and then the other end goes into the optical ethernet connection of the Neo stream. Now, my understanding is, however, they are handling this conversion okay, from electron based transmission to photon based transmission here is uh, iFi's proprietary way of doing it themselves here. So you do want to use this OptiBox, at least that's what their website says. So use their OptiBox. And then though, I do think you can switch out different optical cables there. Now, We'll unpack a little bit more like what impact that um, using the OptiBox has on sound, but I did find it to have a positive impact. So we'll come back to that in a little bit too. Okay. Now let's talk setting this thing up uh, and using it because actually I found this to be pretty close to a plug and play device. I almost exclusively used this as a LAN based streamer, meaning I either plugged it in using an ethernet cable or running through that OptiBox that I just showed you. It will do Wi-Fi. I did not use Wi-Fi much. It just didn't really make sense in my system. Uh, plus I have run ethernet cabling to my main setup right there. So I can just plug it in. As far as using a LAN based connection goes, I plugged it in and it pretty much just set itself up almost automatically set up an IP address, um, did all of those things. Um, all of the software programs that I used and I used um, Ottervana using the DLNA protocol and then I used Rune. Okay, both of those recognized this and transmitted audio to it just like immediately. It was very much a kind of a plug and play thing. So that was really nice to see. Now, if you want to change settings and do all of that, you can try to navigate the front menu or the display will read out the IP address of this device. So you can just go to a web browser on a PC or on your smartphone or whatever. Once you get this um, connected to your network, type in that IP address in the address bar and that will take you right to and like um, a computer based um, what is the the name for the the software system i don't remember it's a common one though and you can just use like basically just like navigating a web page set up everything right there so that was also super easy to do and uh worked pretty flawlessly there okay so the setup was super easy then that translates to the use of this being really easy because all i had to do in either ottervana or in the rune app Okay, either using the Rune app, either on my phone or on my PC or anyway, is just find this audio device, tell the software player to use that audio device and just bang, off and running, it went. Okay, so that really could not have been any smoother. Now, I mentioned a usability quirk and it happens with Rune here. Unfortunately, Every so often, and it's kind of, it seems a little bit random, so I can't really predict when this happens or why, there will be a very brief split second dropout, okay, of the audio when using Rune. It just, music plays, quick dropout, lasts 
like uh, just a fraction of a second, then it usually comes back, no problem. Um, this is uh, apparently an issue that is fairly common uh, with Rune. Again, I did not notice this using Ottervana um, with DLNA at all. Um, so, I mean, I got on the HeadFi thread for this product and apparently there are multiple other users of Rune and this device um, noticing similar problems. And as of the filming of this video, that has yet to be addressed. So that's still hanging out there. Um, now, I did not find that quirk to be deal breaking. It doesn't happen all the time. Um, and again, it's really quick, but it is just a little bit annoying and I wish that they would uh, get that worked out. Now, on that point, it is worth transitioning into, I do have some questions about the support that this device is receiving from iFi. And that is because the firmware version on this is uh, version 2.15.17, which was released all the way back on the 11th of October, 2022. And for context, I filmed this video on April 1st, April Fool's Day, of 2023 so we are just shy of six months away from the uh, latest firmware update which could very well be still be the launch firmware version um, in here so i don't know why it has taken nearly six months and and maybe who, who knows in the week to 10 days or whatever between my filming this and it getting the the video getting a public release iFi may very well update the firmware. I don't know. We'll see. If they do, I will pin a comment down below that that has happened and uh, if it helped with the Rune thing. Um, but I, it does seem like to know that that issue is out there and for it to be nearly six months to get a firmware update um, is not a great look. Okay, So that's something that iFi needs to get on quickly here. All right. Um, other than that, like... Um, you know, once you get in and the music is streaming, it's 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 fine um, from there from a usability standpoint. Now, if it matters to you, this will um, either decode in its own DAC or transmit from at least the USB and the I squared S outputs. Basically, all things two channel audio, PCM files, you know, up to 32 bit 768 kilohertz, um, DSD up to DSD 512, I think. And it will also uh, handle MQA and all of that if you if that is important to you. Okay, so again, feature packed. There's uh, not very many stones unturned with this thing. There. Okay. Uh, so I think that is the bulk of the features. And again, I I want to emphasize I did find this really easy to set up and use. Uh, the Zen stream, which I still have around, can be a bit of a pain sometimes to set up and to get it to do things. This one is an improvement in that regard because it uh, is very nearly plug and play. The only thing you might need to change in the web browser based menu system was it, uh, I believe it defaulted to the analog audio output initially. So if you want to use one of the digital audio outputs, you'll need to manually change that upon first setup, but that's really easy to do. And it just, it went off without a hitch um, for me. So that's not a big deal, I think. Let's take a quick, or, or let's talk about the uh, performance here. And there are really, um, two aspects to the performance here. It's like one, how stable is the connection um, to the network? And again, really stable. The only connectivity issue that I had any problems with is that thing with Rune of just that brief split second dropout that I missed, that I mentioned a few moments ago. Other than that, like it's, its connection is just stable and reliable and like pretty resilient in terms of if you lose power, if you unplug it and you replug it, if you switch from the uh, ethernet to the optic box and all of that, like it just, it really quickly finds its IP address again or just assigns a new one and just you're off and running, right? It's uh, pretty seamless in that regard. So good job there. All right, now, as we turn towards sound performance, let me uh, mention that, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to talk about here. Um, and I usually tell you what test gear that I use with this. So two things I've already mentioned. I use this with Rune. 
which is connected. I use uh, the um, a NUC computer with a the with Rune's Rock operating system on it, and then I also used Ottervana uh, with the DLNA streaming protocol um, as the sources into this device. Now, the downstream stuff from this, in terms of what it was connected to, the list of DAX, amps, headphones, speakers, etc. is too long for me to read off to you here on camera. So what I'm going to do is just say refer to the description below where I will put as complete a list as I can possibly remember of all of those things, DAX, amps, headphones, uh, speakers, all of that that I used. And if I have reviews for those things that I mentioned available, I will put links to those in there too. So that's how we will handle test gear on that. So when we talk sonic performance, there's really two different things that we need to talk about. And is that like, are you going to be using the internal DAC or are you going to be using one of the five digital outputs, right? Uh, and because the experience changes, I think quite dramatically, whether you use the two. Let's start with the, uh, the onboard DAC here, the built-in DAC, just to get that one out of the way. The built-in DAC, again, like is, will decode basically all things two-channel audio and all of that, and you've got that 4.4 millimeter Pentagon, Pentagon balance output and then the stereo RCA output. I did not find the DAC to be horrible, like it's not bad, but it's basically just kind of an entry level balanced DAC level of performance, right? So um, we're talking about like maybe just a little bit better than iFi's own Zen, Zen DAC um, series, but it's kind of on the level with like um, a, a shit Modius, okay? Or if you remember like the SMSL SU8, uh, Mark II DAC, you know, that kind of $200 to $250 balanced DAC. That's about the level of performance that you're getting from the uh, analog outputs on this thing using the built-in DAC. So competent, but not much above the entry level, honestly. Like, I think, like, if you picked up, like, um, Shit's new Mati Multibit 2, or like a Gishelli J2 or something like that, you're going to uh, get a noticeable uh, improvement in DAC performance. Like use the digital output of this into one of those DACs, you'll notice an improvement over the onboard DAC here. Like um, I have used this device with the digital outputs a lot into, uh, I've been doing a number of DAC reviews uh, lately, like the Mati Multibit 2 that I just mentioned, the Musician Draco, um, I've got uh, the Denifrips Ares 12th edition in, I've got the Denifrips Pontus 2 in, a bunch of stuff. Anyway, very noticeable gap between the DAC performance here and something like uh, a Shit by Frost 2 or the SMSL VMV D1SE or that Musician Draco, okay, or the Denifrips Ares 12th. Like, there is definitely a big performance gap between DACs of that level and the built-in DAC here. So again, it's really more of an entry-level DAC performer um, in here, which is not necessarily bad, um, but I, I think that they could have done a little bit better at this price point. And so a little bit later in the video when I talk about like, is this thing worth the money? That point's gonna come back up again. Now, if you wanna talk about sonic performance from the digital outputs, the picture changes quite a bit. From the digital outputs, and I tried basically all of them at some point, because I just named a bunch of DACs that I have been testing on this, okay? Um, plus my mainstays that I use as comparison points got plugged into this thing too. And overall, I found the digital outputs to be very clean, have a very uh, uh, quiet, like black void almost kind of sonic background. Okay, um, a lot of clarity came out of these. Generally speaking, they offered a, a lot of uh, spatial separation and instrument and vocal separation and all of that. So all of the, the signs that this thing is handling its business fairly well from a digital audio output um, standpoint, meaning all of those really fine-grained, subtle things that 
you need to hold it together to really create a compelling sonic package, it does pretty well, right? So, I mean, subtle micro details are still in there and they're not interfered with. There's really not any kind of noise that I could identify that's leaking in here, especially when you use the OptiBox. More on that in a moment. Okay, but there was a lot of clarity and then that really quiet sonic background and all of that. So for the most part, I found that from the digital audio outputs, this thing did a pretty good job of getting out of the way and delivering a really engaging uh, music listening experience more often than not. Now, does it have its own signature? Maybe just slightly. It might tend just a little bit towards uh, smoother and just a little bit warmer, not quite as bright in the treble kind of warmth, like um, as like a true neutral. And I really only noticed that when I compared to another streamer that's a little bit more money than this one. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, did I notice that maybe the top end of this was rolled off ever so slightly, not much, to kind of create just a little bit of a sense of warmth. I don't think the upper bass, lower mids were elevated at all to get warmth that way, kind of like what a, a Sen HD 650 sound is kind of like. Not like that, just a little bit more relaxed treble uh, from the digital outputs there. So um, yeah, as a, as a streaming device, Using the digital outputs, it sounds pretty good, pretty clean, um, all of that. I don't have much to complain about there. Let's talk about using this OptiBox here, performance that way. Um, this really made quite a remarkable uh, improvement, actually. I was a bit skeptical that converting the you know standard Ethernet-based uh, signal to an optical one would make much of a difference, but it really did. Like this, this thing like dropped that already very quiet sonic background all the more. It uh, improved the very subtle detail retrieval kind of stuff in there. Um, it, it helped with the spatial separation, and then it also helped with the... Um, like uh, instrument and vocal separation too. So all of those little subtle changes in there just created a more complete, coherent, and cleaner um, sound with a little bit more clarity, but never with an edge to it. Like it, it, it also helped like just a smoother presentation in there as well. So I really think using this, if you're gonna use an ethernet as, as opposed to Wi-Fi connection, you really wanna stick this in there. Um, and use it because it really made a surprisingly uh, positive impact. And when I use the NeoStream, I personally want this in there because uh, it helps. All right, let's get into comparisons. Like if you're gonna buy a device like this and, and specifically this one, like why might you do that? What are you gonna gain? So let's compare the experience of listening to something like this to a standard, let's just say, USB connection from computer to DAC, okay? Um, because I think something really informative happens there. So computers, even if they are laptops and all of that, tend to be very sonically noisy devices, okay? There was an immediate and noticeable improvement in sound quality just using regular Ethernet LAN cable, not using the OptiBox initially, Okay, and uh, comparing this to the sound of a DAC connected directly to a computer via USB, streaming to this and then connecting to those same DACs, big improvement, okay? Much quieter sonic background, much cleaner overall sound. And then all of that subtle stuff that I mentioned earlier, just the subtly more, subtle uh, improvement in detail retrieval, spatial separation, vocal and instrument separation, like all of that kind of stuff. And then just a, a smoother, more relaxed, less harsh, less fatiguing overall presentation, all that came out moving up to a streamer. Okay. So it really is worth it. Even if it's not this device, I think it really is worth it. If you are using a USB connection directly from your computer to your DAC as your primary listening, you really should strongly consider 
a streamer, or at least a really good DDC because they can make a big difference. Okay. Other comparisons to talk about here real quick. What the Neo Stream also showed me, and I don't know if this is really a, um, a, a compliment to the Neo Stream or if it's a compliment to Rune, okay? But I noticed a definite sonic improvement using Rune with this thing over using the DLNA protocol from Ottervana. Now, is that because Ottervana is still running on a noisy computer and streaming the files directly from that computer into this? Maybe, okay, because Rune uses a core that is not connected to a noisy desktop computer usually. And then like the app that you use with Rune is just a remote control kind of thing. So the computer app just tells the NUC or the core, the Rune core, to send music to an endpoint, which could be a streamer like this, uh, and uh, play the music that way. Anyway, I did notice a big sonic improvement using Rune and the Neo Stream over using Ottervana and the DLNA protocol into the Neo Stream. So there is that. Okay, now, what does this gain you, if anything, over a reasonably good DDC or digital to digital converter? So I compared the sound of this mostly using Rune since that was the higher quality streaming option and the one that I ended up sticking with as because of that. Okay, I compared this to connecting my Singer SU2 DDC using a, I have it written down here, a DH Labs maximum bandwidth USB cable directly into my PC from, from the Singer SU2 into the PC there. Okay, and then I would compare co coax outputs usually, right? So comparing the coax output of the SU2 and the coax output of this guy into my Berkeley Alpha Series 2 using uh, identical coaxial cables, okay? What I found is that the Neo Stream was just very subtly better sounding than using that DDC directly to computer, okay, and then uh, using Rune. So those differences that I just mentioned earlier, okay, just very subtle improvement in detail retrieval, very subtle improvements in spatial coherence, specifically in spatial separation, like just the space between sonic images gets a little bit clearer and more believable, okay? Overall smoother, more refined sound, a better job of separating out instruments from each other and vocals from each other and instruments from vocals and vice versa. Those kinds of things all just took subtle improvements from the Neo stream, okay? Especially with the Optibox in there. Okay, over connecting to the uh, SU2, the DDC, and then dir that direct USB into the computer. So um, the Singer SU2 is a 450, 480 ish dollar DDC now, I think. Um, and it's a pretty good device. I have reviewed it in the past, I've used it a lot. And it's not like this does not run circles around that combo in terms of sound quality, but there is a detectable, subtle improvement in this over that configuration. Okay, comparing this guy to its little sibling model, the Zen Stream, right here is the Zen Stream, we see that there are far more options for one uh, with the Neo Stream over the Zen Stream. So like, and I mentioned this earlier, I found the Neo Stream to be much easier to set up and use than this one. This one can be a little bit quirky and a little bit of a pain to get up and running. And also it only has two output options, the coax SPDIF and then a USB audio output, okay, on it. Um, so again, as far as ergonomics and usability, Neo Stream is a big improvement over this one. Sonically, and then I, the first comparison I did between these two, I'll hold them both up here. The first comparison that I did between these two sonically was to connect them both to my Berkeley Alpha Series 2 DAC via identical uh, mono price uh, coaxial cables and then identical RCA to BNC 
uh, adapter connectors because the Berkeley has BNC and these are RCA coax outputs. Okay. Um, and then also connecting both of these using identical and just basic, I think, Amazon brand um, Ethernet cables. So not using the optical box, but just using regular LAN connection here. And then using my Rune app, putting both of the iFi streamers in the same Rune zone so they got fed identical signals and all of that, and then switch back and forth using my Berkeley Okay, to switch between its two coax inputs to uh, test the sound uh, differences on these. So in that configuration, I did find the Neo stream to again just barely edge out the Zen stream in many of the same ways that I've described this already because like this was a consistent thing that I found that what improves from the Zen to the Neo is the sonic background gets a little bit quieter. The spatial separation gets a little bit more believable, leading to an overall more coherent and slightly more holographic spatial presentation. The detail retrieval just gets subtly and uh, better, okay, just so that little micro details and all of that come out just a little bit more clearly. Okay, and then also is just a little bit smoother and more refined, less fatiguing. So things like cymbal crashes in particular just sound a little bit smoother, a little bit more natural, and over time less fatiguing from the Neo than from the Zen Stream. No individual performance characteristic is a huge difference there, but you add up those tiny differences and you get a more complete, believable, and like higher quality listening experience from the Neo than you do the Zen. Add the OptiBox back in there for the, uh, the Neo, and that difference just becomes all the bigger. Yet again, all of those traits that I just mentioned just become the gaps get bigger. Okay. What is consistent between these two, though, is they, are, they both have basically identical uh, presentations in terms of dynamics. Okay, and also in terms of like a perceived frequency response. They both kind of have that slight relax the treble just a little bit um, so that they sound just slightly warm kind of presentation to them um, in that way, which isn't a surprise because they're made by the same people, right? While I'm here, actually, I'll come back and say, so the Zen Stream is like 400 US dollars, 400 Euro in price. Is the Neo Stream fully worth $900 more than this one? Sonically, even with the OptiBox, in terms of pure sound, no. The Neo is easier to set up and use, so there is improvement there, and the Neo has way more features. I'm still not totally convinced that the difference is worth $900, though, so I will come back to that point again at the end of the video as well. Last comparison I want to do, it's uh, hard to see, but it is the Cord 2 Go. Okay, which is hiding inside this case right here. Yes, I got the black version when I have a silver Hugo too because I got this uh, the, the two go for about half the price of its MSRP used. Okay, so beggars can't be choosers. Anyway, what I did here is I used the, the two go that's in here inside the case, right, in, in Wi Fi mode, all right, and then USB input into the Hugo 2 and then use the Hugo 2 as a DAC RCA output into my VIO V281 and then used both the Susvara and the Utopia as a headphone. Then I used the coax output of the Neo Stream with a coax digital audio cable and then one of these little things, okay, 3.5 millimeter adapter into the coax input on the Hugo 2, then, you know, Hugo 2 as a DAC there. To compare these two streamers. Okay, I left the Neo Stream plugged in via um, the OptiBox and all of that. So, I mean, Wi Fi here, OptiBox LAN here, which should give the advantage, you would think, LAN connection to the Neo Stream. What I found here, though, and, and I should say that the 2Go is also $1,500 in uh, MSRP, so it's a bit more expensive than this less fully featured in terms of connectivity and all of that. Um, so keep that in mind here too. Now, the differences that I've been describing about the Neo being better than it's the th other things that I've compared it to, 
were consistent here too, except they went the other way. Okay, the two go to me was a bit quieter yet, had a little bit more clarity. It had the slightly better resolution, the slightly better spatial and instrument separation, okay, and all of that kind of thing. So it sounded a little bit better. It also had a slight smoothness advantage to it, okay, and a, uh, again, a less fatiguing kind of presentation. It also is the device that led me to say what I said earlier about, I think the, the two iFi's, both the Neo and the Zen, and I've heard this with the Zen in comparison to other streamers too, okay, is that they roll off the top end just a little bit, and so that kind of creates a sense of warmth to their presentation. The Tugo does not do that. It, uh, I, I would say it's a little bit closer to too neutral, to true neutral, excuse me, in its uh, perceived frequency response presentation. You can notice this with cymbal hits. Cymbal hits have just a little bit more presence to them. They are just a little bit more forward on the Tugo than on either of the iFi's. But they are still smoother and more natural sounding in their timbre and less fatiguing to my ears than either of the iFi's were there, were in that way too. Okay, so I think that the Tugo is actually the slightly higher performing sonically, even from Wi-Fi, which I think says something, um, streamer than the Neo Stream. And again, it's only $200 more. The other remarkable thing about the Tugo, and when I get around to a full review of, um, of it, I will say this there too, is that the, uh, the USB input on the Hugo 2, which the Tugo has to use, okay, um, is not great because it doesn't have any built-in galvanic isolation because it needs to be compatible with the USB outputs of DAPs and other portable devices and that sort of thing. So the fact that the Tugo sounded better via USB than the Neo did into the Hugo 2's preferred digital inputs, which are its SPDIF, right? Those usually sound better than the USB. The fact that the Tugo beat out the Neo USB versus SPDIF, I think says something about it too, where um, not only is it a great sounding device, but the USB implementation on it is also very strong. So that is uh, something to keep in mind there too. All right, those are the comparisons. Let's wrap this up, okay? There's been a lot of information here. So the Neo Stream, again, it's well built. It is ergonomically friendly. It is easy to use, minus that rune dropout um, thing. That is not a huge issue, not a deal breaker for me, um, but it is a little bit annoying. And it does seem like iFi has been slow to address that, which is a, a potential red flag to keep an eye on. Okay, um, but feature set amazing, ergonomics really good, and again, it's in a well-built package. The built-in DAC is nothing to write home about. It's okay. It's basically a 200-ish dollar uh, balanced DAC, like kind of on that level of performance, okay? The quality from the digital audio outputs is really high. You get lots of different digital outputs. So being able to match to your system, you get lots of options. The OptiBox, if you're using a LAN connection, I strongly recommend this because it made a huge positive difference. More detail, quieter sonic background, better spatial separation, vocal and imaging separation, just a more coherent and believable sonic presentation using this than just a direct LAN uh, connection. Okay, the improvement over a direct USB connection to a computer, between computer and DAC, to a streamer like this is huge really cannot be overstated. I would strongly encourage everyone to look into that sort of thing. This device, the Neo Stream, can outperform some entry-level DDC kinds of, of devices like my Singer SU2 um, to a, a small degree, but it's noticeable, so that's something, okay? This thing is a sonic improvement, especially with the OptiBox over iFi's entry-level streamer, the Zen Stream. Okay, noticeable improvement there. It doesn't quite catch the more expensive Cord Tugo streamer in there. All of that. So, listening to all of that stuff, 
taking into account, into account the performance, the features, the ergonomics, and all of that, what is my takeaway on the Neo Stream? It is a very good device, okay? Uh, it does a lot of things well. There is a lot to like about it. It's going to make many people very happy. I do think that for most end users, 1300 euro or US dollars is a little bit steep. I think as a streaming device, even including the OptiBox and with the digital output complement that it has, okay, if you could put just the streaming device, drop this screen, which is kind of just, you know, not really necessary in my opinion, okay, take that out, offer this as a streamer with just the digital outputs and the OptiBox and optical ethernet on this thing, charge 800-ish dollars for it, it's a home run of a product at that point, okay? Because um, I do think that with the OptiBox and the connectivity and all of that, it's easily worth double the price of the ZenStream, which is $400, okay, and all of that. The built-in DAC is a bit of a letdown, um, and I think does um, raise the value question a little bit. I just don't quite see how we get from the $800, which I think would be a fair price just for the streaming aspects of this, to $1,300 with the DAC that's in here. Not seeing that. Okay, so if you see a sale on this device where it gets down to maybe a thousand, maybe eleven hundred ish dollars, all of that, grab it. Okay, grab it. Um, I think there's going to be a very small number of people out there who uh, who can truly get thirteen hundred dollars worth of use out of it, um, just because I think the DAC in there is a little bit of a letdown. So to really get the value near thirteen hundred, you'd need to use the built-in DAC, and I just don't think it's uh, up to snuff with the rest of the quality of the product. Okay, now for me as a reviewer. I really hope iFi lets me hang on to it because the sheer number of digital outputs and connectivity options and features and all of that are really useful in helping me evaluate gear and the performance from the digital outputs is still pretty darn good, right? It's pretty good. Um, so yeah, iFi, I do hope you let me hang on to it and use it as a, a reviewing tool um, in return you'll get the product name mentioned in a lot of future videos as the source gear. Um, and of course, the descriptions of all those videos will have links back to this one, which might help you sell more. Um, but do please, if I uh, update the firmware soon and get that rune issue figured out. Okay. Is that enough? That was a lot, right? I will go ahead and stop there. I am Wave Theory. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like this video, subscribe if you haven't yet. Uh, leave a comment down below. Tell me what you think about this review, about this device, etc. Please check out my Patreon, Patreon and my PayPal so you can help support the channel in those ways too. And as always, thanks for watching and enjoy the music.